So, welcome to Religion, Religious Experiences, and Spirituality. Again, I will be your teacher for this subject. I'm Shady D. Maliari Lugtu. And let's start with our first topic. So, chapter one is all about religion. So, this will be the in introduction of the whole SSP. It will have seven sections, if I am not mistaken. So, objective of chapter one will be looking at the broad definition of, def of religion, understanding the rules of belief and theology, discover the power and purpose of rituals, recognize the universality of religious ethics, understanding the attraction of religion has for so many people, knowing how religion differs from philosophy and spirituality. So let's go to section one, which is religion, a quick definition. You could say that religion is a belief, except not all beliefs are religions. You could narrow that definition and say religion is a belief in God. Well, that's the definition covers monotheistic religion, which are religion that believe that there is one God. But it doesn't cover the religions that believe in many gods, which are the polytheistic religions, or religions that believe in a chief god and other or lesser gods and goddesses, which are called the henotheistic religions. You can also say that religion is a way of behaving, being decent to others, and caring for environment. But not all decent responsible people are religious. You could also say that religion is the belief in truth. But what is truth per se? Remember that different religions have different understanding of what is true. So basically, the definition of religion includes all of this definition because religion is a belief in a divine may be a superhuman or a spiritual being or beings and practices which are the rituals and moral code which encompasses ethics that results from that belief beliefs give religions its mind rituals give religions its shape and ethics give religion its heart Again, beliefs give religion its mind, rituals give religion its shape, and ethics give religion its heart. So the basic theology for section one is every religion has a belief system, and each religion teaches or expounds its own truth about the world and humanity and God or gods for other, as those truths are seen by that particular faith. This beliefs also explain how a religion follower achieves salvation or enlightenment and why these are important goals for their religious or spiritual journey. From these fundamental beliefs flow the beliefs that establish authority and explain how the leaders of the organized religion rightfully exercise the power of that authority. So through these belief systems, religions teach us these truths about life and that suffering, hope, and whatever comes after that. So the afterlife. These beliefs give meaning to this to the lives of religious or religions follower and sustain hope in the face of suffering and loss. We will be tackling a lot of that in a while. So beliefs are the ideas that makes any religion what it is. Of these three elements that make something a religion, which was beliefs, rituals, and ethics, beliefs are the most important because they give rise to and shape the ethics and the rituals of faith. In religious theology, which is its religious teaching or doctrine, and its stories connect the beliefs. A religion's theology is its handbook of beliefs, although many theologies are not even written down. 
Theology is important because it puts a religion's belief in an order that people can understand. Some religions, such as Christianity and Islam, have a long tradition of theologies that are complex and sophisticated. Other religions, such as Judaism and Hinduism, use stories such as systematic theologies to convey their beliefs. For this reason, painting down the essential beliefs of Judaism or Hinduism is much more difficult. Yet other religions such as Zoroastrianism and Buddhism combines both of, of such beliefs such as the complex and the simple beliefs. So whether or not religions use theology or storytelling as the main way to teach their beliefs depends on the following. The first is their history. So both Judaism and Hinduism are very ancient and developed before the contact with the Greeks, who first organized the beliefs into a system. In the ancient faith, stories, storytelling, convey beliefs, and the impulse to yank the beliefs out of the stories and put them down in some systematic order would have been an insult to the sacred text. How they define membership is also a way of why the, their theology differ. So tribal religions define member of faith not by beliefs but by blood. So many Native American religions such, a, such are like Judaism in this respect because you have to be born into a tribe or a culture in order to share the faith of the tribe. If you are born in a tribal religion, you, what you believe doesn't matter very much. As long as you are a member, whether or not you like it or not, and whether you believe in the religion or not, therefore you are a member of that religion. In contrast, belief-oriented or open religions such as Islam and Christianity seek converts, so they convert their members. These religions need to have a clear and easily identifiable theologies because people need to understand the religion's belief in order to join up. A good example is the Shahada in the Islamic profession of faith, which is, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is a prophet. So this simple and powerful statement of belief is all you have to say to enter the Islam and become a Muslim. So let's go to section 2, which is belief of the Western religion. Judaism, Christianity, and Islams are the religions that many call the Western religions. Again, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are also known as the Western religions. People sometimes call these beliefs of these three religions as the Judeo-Christian tradition. But we dislike that term because it leaves out the Islam. Because all these three religions trace themselves back through Abraham. Abraham is considered the first patriarch or the father of the ancient Hebrew families from his descendants of the followers of Islam and Christianity, we think that that term Abrahamic tradition or Abrahamic religions fits better. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity share many common beliefs. All three religions believe that one single, all-powerful, all-knowing God, called Allah by Muslims, created the world out of nothing. This God made everything in the world and gave living things a special blessing. Human life was not only blessed by God, but also made 
in the image of God, which gave it special sanctity. Abrahamic faith, such as Christian sects, Judaism, and Islam, believe that God gave human beings free will to decide how they would live and a code of moral law and commandments for a life that would set a path for living a good and holy life. Abrahamic religions believe that God will eventually redeem the world from all its sins and imperfections and usher in an age of universal peace. Although this messianic age may be preceded by terrible wars, the three religions believe that God has worked and continues to work through the events of history and has commanded people to do His will in the world. God revealed all this to humanity through prophets and according to Christianity through a Messiah or Savior named Jesus Christ. The written records of this re revelation form the sacred texts of Abrahamic religions. For the Hebrew Bible, called the Old Testament by some, but not by Jews, New Testament for Christians, and Quran for Muslims. These religions differ in important areas. However, and some of the main differences focus on the Christian idea of the Trinity and Christian beliefs in Jesus as Messiah and Son of God. So let us first tackle the Trinity. Christians believe in one God, and as do Jews and Muslims, but they describe God as being made up of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. To the Jewish community, this idea of Trinity looked like a belief of three separate God, and it has enlarged the break between early Christianity and Judaism. Muslims had the same problem with this concept of Trinity. They believe that the Trinity comprises Christianity's belief in one God. Jesus is a Messiah to, to Christian. Jesus is the Messiah's Savior. Judaism, however, required that the Messiah bring world peace and a gathering of all Jews, Jewish exile. Because Jesus didn't do this, another break occurred between Judaism and Christianity. As the result of debate regarding whether Jesus actually was the Messiah, the Jews hoped for. Muslims regarded Jesus as one of the great prophets, like those Moses, Abraham, and Muhammad, to whom miracles are attributed. But they believe that he was unable to complete his mission. Therefore, another final teaching, the Quran, was necessary. Jesus as the Son of God The Christian believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and therefore is both God and man, differ from Jewish and Muslim belief that God could never become human. To Muslims, Jesus was a prophet, but not the Son of God. In fact, that Allah would have a son is, in the Muslim view, improper. It's not worthy of the beneficent Allah that he should take to himself a son. That is based on Quran 19, 92. So let us talk about their sacred texts. So, as I've said earlier, the holy book forms a tangible core for religions, whether it is the Christian Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or the Quran. This sacred Christian Bible and the Islamic holy book, because we will be tackling this on the next chapters of this semester. So the Hebrew Bible includes no personal Messiah, and its prophets proclaim an ethical and as well as ritual duty to serve God. This holy book also includes a covenant with Noah that covers all people, not just Jews, a covenant with Abraham that applies only to Jews, and the book concludes with a miscellaneous of writings, the largest part of which are the Psalms 
or the sacred songs. In the Hebrew Bible, the line, there is one God called Yahweh, Elohim, and El Shaddai. You should, you should pronounce Yahweh like Yahweh. But Jesus don't do so. When this name of God appears in the text, Jesus replaced it in public readings with Adonai, meaning my Lord. The Christian Bible. Many denominations are sects within um, Christianity except the holiness and the divine revelation of the Hebrew Bible, adopted into the Christian Bible as the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. It composes the first and the lengthier half of the Christian holy book. The New Testament makes up for the other shorter portion. So the New Testament is consists of four gospel, namely Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostle, which is the chronicle of the first year or the early church history, the epistles or the letters of Paul to the to the churches, which are which to give advice and instruction for living a life according to Christ, and the revelation, which describe how God has intervened throughout history. Quran is made up of 114 chapters called surahs. The Quran outlines what Muslim moral and religious duties are in the light of God's wishes in preparation for the Day of Judgment. In other words, the Quran gives instruction on how to build a society that is compatible with the moral life that Allah demands. The Islamic holy book accepts the divine revelation of the Hebrew Bible and the absolute unity and uniqueness of God as taught in the Hebrew Bible. The Quran does not recognize Jesus as the son of Allah, God, but does accept Jesus as a prophet of Allah. The Qurans consider Muhammad to be the most written and final prophet, prophet of Allah. The Quran traces the origin of Islam back recent and final prophet of Allah. The Quran traces the origin of Islam back to Hagar, who is according to the Christian tradition, was a concubine of Abraham, but who, according to the Islam tradition, was Abraham's second wife. So Muslim look to her son Ishmael as the founder of their religion and heritage. According to the Islamic belief, the Quran is the perfect transcription of the infallible word of God. The Quran continues and, cul and culminates the revelation that God began in the Old and New Testaments. As the perfect earthly representation of God's world, words, Muslims believe that the Quran cannot be adequately translated but should be read or preferably heard in Arabic. Let's move to section 3, which is the belief of Eastern religions. Hinduism and other several religions and sects make up considered the Eastern religions. Chief among these religions are Hinduism, Buddhism, but this category also includes Taoism and Confucianism, which is the primary religion of China, and Shinto, the primary religion of Japan. The Eastern religion have rich and ancient traditions dating back in some instances, thousands of years. Following are the cursory explanation of the main tenets of some of these religions. Let us first discuss Taoism. Taoism, founded more than 2,000 years ago in China by Lao Tzu, the person credited as author of the Tao Te Ching, the Book of Tao philosophy, this religion advocates simplicity and selflessness in conformity with the Tao. The central or organizing principle of the universe. According to the law of Tao, literally translated as the way, everything reverts to its starting point and the whole is contained in its part. Through the Tao, everything moves from a state of non being to being to non being again. By allowing the Tao to flow and challenge the world, becomes a tranquil place. 
Confucianism is from a renowned teacher with thousands of students and 72 close disciples. Confucius, who lived date back in 551 to 479 BCE, believed that the perfectly perfectibility perfectibility of humanity through the cultivation of the mind. His teaching emphasizes devotion to parents and rituals, learning, self-control, and just social activity. Although more a worldview for living, a just and moral life, and not an organized religion itself, Confucius' idea became the standard in Chinese politics and scholarship and were eventually recognized as the imperial ideology. Confucianism has had a huge impact on other Eastern religions as da such as Taoism and Buddhism. Hinduism is the main religion, religious tradition in India. Hindus believe in Brahman, an eternal infinite principle that had no beginning and has no end, and is the source and substance of all existence. Hindus believe in the transmigration, the soul passing into another body at death, and reincarnation or a cycle of death and rebirth. Hindus also believe in karma, the idea that our or your action in one life have a direct effect on the events in your next life. So for Hindus, salvation comes when they are finally released from the cycle of death and rebirth or reincarnation. Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism. It is the primary religion of Central and Eastern Asia. For Buddhists, the world is a preset of suffering and illusion that keeps people from reaching freedom and enlightenment. Buddhists believe that the purpose of life is to learn that nothing lasts and that suffering comes from being attached to things of ordinary existence. Until people learn this, they are destined to repeat the cycle of their death and rebirth reincarnation by freeing themselves from desire and giving up their sense of self can people be free from this cycle. So karma is a moral and spiritual result of our actions. Our karma is the sum of all our deeds and it is if it is good we will advance towards happiness, perfection and enlightenment. And if our karma is bad, we return to our former state of existence or life. Certain special people make it to the stage of perfect knowledge, which is called the moks, moksha. In Hinduism, the nirvana and nirvana in Buddhism. So moksha in Hinduism, nirvana in Buddhism. Some of this enlightened soul return to teach humanity about the path of freedom and are called bodhisattvas what he shall pass in Hinduism or Lamas in Buddhism. Shinto is an indigenous religion of Japan. Shinto emphasizes the worship of nature, ancestors, and ancient heroes. The religion stresses the virtue of living with a true heart, that is, with sincerity and uprightness, a state that is possible only by being aware of the divine. So if the, if the Western religion has sacred texts, the Eastern religion also have their holy texts. So following are the very brief introduction of some of these holy texts, considered holy, if not holy, of special significance to Eastern religions. So Taoism has two particular books, which are the Tao Te Ching and the Chua Chu, Chuang Chu. So, the Tao Te Ching is the book of Taoist philosophy, traditionally considered, considered to have written by Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, and it was intended to be a handbook for the ruler. On the other hand, the Chao Chuang Tzu, written by Taoist philosopher Chuang Shu, 
an important early interpreter of Taoism serve as a handbook for the individual. So this book both proposed that acting in accordance with the Tao or the universal oneness of existence bring peace and harmony to the individual and to the society. For Confucianism, there is not, not strictly holy texts. There are five classics, are um, the 2,000-year-old book that detail Confucians, ideas on Chinese law, society, government, education, and literature, as well as religion. This work became the core curriculum in Chinese universities in the second century and are still studied up until today. Hinduism, according to Hindus, neither man nor God wrote the Vedas, Book of Knowledge, instead shears, so shears are the, um, the prophets or the, the prophets in Hindus. So heard them and then transcribed them into Sanskrit. So the books of the Vedas are four, which is which are the Rig Veda, Yakur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atar Atarva Veda. So Rig Veda are the wisdom of verses. Yahur Veda are wisdom of sacrificial formulas. Sama Veda are wisdom of the chants and Atharva Veda are wisdom of the Atharvan free priest. Another important task for Hindus are the Bhagavad Gita or the Son of Songs for God, which explain the path of salvation. So there's another one of holy texts which includes the Sutras, the Satras, and the Smitris. Smitis, Smitis, which were written by man. So a little bit of a twister for the Hinduist text. Which is, what is important are the spelling, make sure of the spelling. So Buddhism, although not used the same form by all Buddhist texts, the Tripitaka or the Sanskrit for triple basket. So Tripitaka is the canon of the Southern School of Buddhism. The Tripitaka con Prices of three sections, which are the Vina, Vinaya Pitaka, basket discipline, which regulate monastic, monastic life, Shuta Pitaka, which is the basket of discourse, which includes the sermons and admon, admoni, admonitions attributed to the first Buddha, Shidhara Gautama, Abhidhamma Pitaka, Basket of Special Doctrines, a section for supplemental texts. For Shinto, religion does not have sacred texts as such. The works that come closest to being Shinto scripture are the Kojiki, or the Records of Ancient Matters, and the Hihon Shoki, or the Chronicles of Japan. These books record the oral tradition of ancient Shinto and details history of Japan. Let's go to section four, religions and rituals. Rituals are important to religions because they provide tangible way for believers to experience their faith. Beliefs are the province of your mind, but rituals get the rest of your body into the act. Through rituals, religions take physical form. These practices give texture and taste form and function to a religion. So religion rituals establishes the secret calendar and its duties. We will be discussing that more in section two. Set the ways followers celebrate the passage in life and focus the mind in a spiritually disciplined way. Religious rituals are also often limited to the people who make up the particular religion. In fact, many religions specifically prevent those of other faiths from practicing their traditional rituals. So it will be considered sacrilegial, sacrilegious for you to practice them. When Judaism instructs Jews to light candles on Friday night, it's a ritual meant especially only for Jews. When some Christian groups such as Roman Catholics, Greek, Orthodox offer Holy Communion, also known as the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, or the remembrance of the Lord's sacrifice, only their member can receive it. The Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca 
or the Hajj is only for Muslims. Prayer is another ritual, so all, all religions include prayers. People pray to express thankfulness for life's blessing, to repent for sins, to grant forgiveness to other people. They pray to clear and focus their minds. They pray so that they can achieve calmness and wisdom. They pray to express awe and wonder at the mystery of life and at the beauty of the world around them. They pray to find release from suffering. They pray while kneeling, while standing, with eyes downcast, lifted to heaven. They pray alone. They pray as a community. They pray as prescribed, prescribed times and prescribed ways and pray whenever the mood hits them. Prayers for the Catholic Mass is a prayer service that includes the most important Christian ritual, the Eucharist, and define the community that prays together. For many Buddhists and Hindus, sex pray for many hours at a time. They find solace and release from stress by looking inside themselves in order to express this, the great void or emptiness. This emptiness quiets them and frees them from all constraints of their own lives. For a Muslim, five times a day they remember Allah and their relationship with Him. The consent of their prayer includes praise, gratitudes, and supplication. The prayers proposed in is to keep life and their place in it, be submissive to God in perspective. For a Jewish prayer must be said three times a day, although afternoon and evening prayers are often combined with special prayers added for the Shabbat or Sabbath day and holidays. A formal Jewish prayer service requires a minyan, which is a group of 10 Jewish male adults. For more liberal or Jewish, Jewish a minyan consists of 10 Jewish adults of any gender. Regardless of how they do it or when they do it, or what they're praying for, people pray to communicate with what their religion considered sacred or holy. So let's go to section 5, which is religions and ethics. If beliefs give religion their distinctive wisdom and rituals, give religions their distinct form. When ethics give religions their distinctive virtue, the ethics of our religions are both personal and communal. Some ethical teaching direct followers how to live their own lives, while other ethical teaching of religion explain how to order society. Ethics compose the moral code of life, the way people should live with one another and with nature, by following the ethical or moral code, any person can live a good and decent, compassionate, just, and loving life. Ethics give religion its moral force and universal message. And it all comes down to deciding on what is right and what is the universal message. And it all comes down to deciding what is the right thing to do. So the universal ethic is that belief and rituals of the world religions are very different. So you may be this actually be surprised to discover that the ethics of the world's religions are almost identical. Their dissimilarity even holds for religions that haven't had much contact with the rest of the world. So for example, in the Talmud or a post-biblical commentary on the Jewish law and legend, you can find the saying sticks in a bundles are unbreakable, but stick alone can be broken by a child. This ethical teaching about the value of community is also found exactly in the Maasai tribe of sub-Saharan sub Africa. On the, on another example is the golden rule, which is do unto others what you have them do unto you appear in almost the same word in many different and geographical separate fits. For some reason, religions that don't share a single common belief or ritual may actually share the same vision of human virtue. Some theologians explain the common ethical teaching of the world's religion by a concept called the natural law. 
The idea is that human life produces common ethical law for the same reason. The physical law, like the law of gravity, are the same in any part of the universe. Natural law, imagine a kind of a universal law of human goodness. Somehow, the nature of human existence leads all people to derive the same ethical forms. Perhaps the natural law is real. Maybe it's some kind of a divine revelation to all people. Or maybe it is something we don't understand yet. What's most important is that many of his teachings don't vary much from religion to religion. That, similar, that similarity is a mystery to us, but a very wonderful mystery. Ethic beliefs and rituals. Some folks say that because the ethics of the world religions are similar, we should just throw out all the different beliefs and rituals and stick with the ethical teaching. A religion called ethical culture is actually founded in 1876 and tries to do just what I've said. One reason this approach probably wouldn't work is in the long run is that many religious ethics are part of religious rituals. The Passover meal in Judaism is both a ritual and an ethical commentary on the importance of freedom. The Hindu practice of meditation is a part of the ethical teaching of tranquility and patience. The tea ceremony in Zen Buddhism is both a ritual and a way to teach the value of hospitality. Rituals that may seem to be nothing more than tribal rites end up containing tribal ethical wisdom when you look more closely. Another reason that separating religious ethic from religious ritual and beliefs wouldn't work is because ethics are thought through sacred texts and stories that are particular to a religion, even though the ethics itself is universal. Some of the Jakarta legends of Buddha, for example, teach compassion by linking this particular ethic to a related story in Buddha's life. Although you can make the same point by compassionate, be compassionate to others without the story, you rob it of the power of narrative. The tone of the parable, the short religious story found in the Old and New Testament, for example, is deliberately intended to be mysterious and suggestive to better the, the better to drive home the moral spiritual truth. So why do people flock in religion? In the world of high pressure, sales approve to me I need it mentality. It's normal that people expect religion to sell itself to them with the promise of money, problem-free life, and miracle cures. But people of faith, religion generally offers something deeper. Some of these things are tangible, and most are not. For example, one of the main beliefs of religion is hope. The hope that tomorrow will be a better day will be better than today, and the hope that that is not the end of us, the, the hope that good will win. The essence, religion, in essence, religion offers people a way to navigate a broken world full of cruelty and disappointment. Dealing with problems begin small. So most religions maintain that one primary, primary hurdle, hurdle stops people from realizing their potential. By being able to overcome this hurdle, people can achieve whatever the ultimate reward in their religion is. So in Buddhism, the biggest problem is suffering. And Buddhism solved that problem by offering a path of enlightenment where suffering is no more. For Abrahamic faiths, sin is the problem. And Judaism and Christianity and Islam offer a path of salvation from sin. The three paths to salvation are different, but the goal is the same. For Hinduism, the problem is being repeatedly reincarnated. Hinduism offers a solution to the problem of rebirth by offering a way to release or the moksha from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. 
Suffering, sin, rebirth are the cosmic problems affecting all people, and the solution that religion offer are solution that applies to all people. Religions also provide answers to big problems that are confound people. What is the meaning of life? What have to, happens after death? Why do innocents suffer? How can we live a decent life in a crummy world? This and other questions have vexed human from time immemorial. The faithful religion provides the answer to questions like this too. Religions don't generally promise solutions to daily personal problems. Instead, they help people deal with problems and accept that suffering the problem may cause. Many people use religious faith as a way to maintain courage and patience as they work their way from sorrow or hardship into a time of joy and happiness. For many, living a life of faith is a way to deal with problems, not a way to magically sweep them away. So another reason why people flock to religion is finding joy. Many people find joy in religions. Hindus call the ultimate happiness as moksha, the term that refers to finally having perfection and being released from the constant reincarnation. Christians call this as ecstasy, the time when the believer through faith experienced the inner vision and union with God. Jews call it the shimha, the joy they feel when they experience the Torah. This joy comes from immersing oneself in divine and from the immersion being able to appreciate the beauty and wonder of life in all its form and rejoicing at being alive to share that wonder. This type of happiness is far different from the happiness that the advertiser tried to convince people will come if they just buy new things. Religious happiness points believer to lasting joy, to the joy of family and friends, the joy of rituals, the joy of flight passages, by challenging them to examine the happiness that comes from selfishness and replace it with selfless acts of kindness and generosity. Religious people believe that the greatest happiness comes from helping others, seeking wisdom, and doing God's work. Another way why do people flock to religion is so that they will be responsible. Many people find religion a guide that guides them to do good works by challenging and goading and guiding them to do their part to fix the broken world. This guide reminds people of their duty to the poor, the widowed, the orphan, the homeless. This source impels them to accept duty as a way of serving the divine, even when the duty is burdensome or exhausting. In Islam, the link between the devout, life, and one of service is particularly notable. Yuban, the noblest God's creature, according to the Quran, have a tendency to fall into arrogance. Humans the previous seen in Islam consider themselves God's partners. To help them remember the purpose of their existence, Muslims must struggle against their pride. One way to do so is to go beyond themselves and serve people who are less fortunate. So important is this obligation to help others that the third of the five pillars or duties of Islam is to give to charity. A great 19th century preacher once said, happiness is natural fruit of duty, which suggests that religions can make you happy, but only if you're doing the right thing makes you happy. For example, if walking out on the people the right thing makes you happy. For example, if walking out on the people you love and need you makes you happy, chances are you are going to be miserable in your religion. Next is accepting suffering. Suffering is a part of life. 
the illness of someone we love, the death of a child, a hundred other defeats we suffer every day are often not caused by our choices and are not within our own power to solve. If you didn't cause the suffering, you can't do anything about it. From it. Every religious tradition answered the question of suffering differently. Help. Life is an immense comfort, but the lesson goes beyond that. Christian believes that God is compassionate, and Christianity teaches his followers to be compassionate to others. In this way, personal suffering can produce positive outcomes. Although accepting God when things are bad is difficult to do, Christians believe that this acceptance is essential if they are to acquire a mature faith. At the end of the Jewish funeral service, the last words spoken at the grave are Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakak, Isham Adonai. Bless God when God is giving us that then it is to bless God when God is taking from us. God, that everything we have is just a gift, just alone from God, and that is must it must be surrendered someday. Tarava, Taravada Buddhism teaches that suffering is an illusion that comes from our desires. We make ourselves unhappy because we don't accept the pain that comes from being attached to the things, people, and feelings in our lives. We crave things that make us miserable when we don't get them. We love people because that causes us pain when they die. According to the Theravada Buddhism, the only way we can find peace is to abandon our attachment to our desires, hopes, and dreams. In this release of attachment, we will find the happiness we are looking for in our lives. The Buddha wants help solve problems of creeps for Comforting awareness that every person has been touched by death. It's with the Hindu faith, suffering as having a purpose. The goal of release from the cycle of reincarnation continues until a person can finally free him or herself from the desires, which keeps the cycle going. The suffering people experience in this life is a result of their karma in, from their former life. By acting to relieve suffering, a person cannot escape the reincarnation process. In addition, many Hindus believe that by taking away the suffering, a person might be reborn in a lower form. So although this might be easier in this life, they could be that much worse in the next. So, last section for this chapter is religion and spirituality. Religion is organized in ancient spirituality. Nowadays, however, you often hear it's hard to understand. It's not always clear what that is. This is the last. First, spirituality does not require membership within an orchard nor does it, does it have the authority structured. Second, spirituality is the willingness that was it 
principles, ethics, and belief of that single religion. Third, spirituality deeply personal. Both sides, religion and spirituality, weigh in within their ideas and how one is better than the other. For us, religion and spirituality aren't two opposing ideas. They're just two ways of speaking about human 